Our next speaker, unfortunately, John, does work with the FBI. So be careful. Thomas Callahan is the chief biometric scientist for the FBI laboratory's biometric analysis section and has served as the FBI's senior DNA advisor for human DNA identification for the last 10 years. Dr. Callahan has served as chairman of the National DNA Index System Procedures Board and as a member of both Interpol's DNA Monitoring Experts Group and the G8 Law Enforcement DNA Technical Working Group. As a member of the FBI DNA Analysis Unit, he was involved in the analysis of hundreds of homicide and rape cases. In 2003, he became the first CODIS Unit Chief and has been involved with the FBI CODIS program for over 25 years. Since 2008, Tom has been involved in the research and planning for the FBI's biometric initiative. Dr. Callahan represents the FBI on the Forensic Committee of the International Association of Chiefs of Police and is a member of the Organization of Scientific Area Committee, BIOSAC. Please welcome Dr. Callahan. Thank you, Ken. Uh, it really is uh, an honor to, uh, to be speaking uh, here today. I became a forensic scientist nearly 30 years ago, and so I've been where you are. Uh, and I was quite surprised last July when Ken sent an email and asked me to participate uh, in, the, in the plenary session and given a keynote address. And so my first thing was, wow, uh, after the shock, uh, should I do this and can I do this? Um, and so, you know, they wanted biometrics covered. And so um, I went to the FBI ex executive management uh, for the laboratory uh, and I said, hey, I got this invitation. And so they were very encouraging. I said, I'm leaving in two weeks to take a month off, uh, visiting my son and my wife and I are visiting our son in South in uh, Buenos Aires for a semester abroad. And then I'm going to ride my motorcycle, a bucket list item across the country. And so how do I get all this together in two days? And so during the day, the encouragement turned to uh, just do it. Write the, uh, write the abstract, get the title together, get it submitted, get it done before you leave. And so that's what I did. But I had that long plane ride to Buenos Aires. And that's when I started to put this together. So what I've done uh, to try and talk about biometrics and, and the border is take slide decks from the Department of Homeland Security uh, and then from NGI, the FBI's fingerprint repository, uh, facial recognition, um, uh, face services uh, unit out at the, uh, in, in our Clarksburg, West Virginia facility, and then DNA. And so the three large databases that the FBI uh, has. And so what I'd like to do here is um, I'm not an expert in fingerprints or an expert uh, in facial recognition, but I have been involved for the last 12 years in the FBI's biometric initiative. And that started when I got a phone call. For the first 14 years, I was uh, involved with CODIS and DNA, and I, I was getting burned out. And so I got a phone call uh, that said uh, from a, an FBI executive, the FBI had five branches at this time. This was a branch lead. So this is like a four-star general in the FBI. I didn't know him very well. I had briefed him a few times. And he said, we want, a next, we want a scientist at headquarters to look at biometrics and to make assessments and give us uh, frank, unvarnished assessments and come up with some priorities on resource allocation. And so um, other than the commute, would you have any concerns for leaving Quantico and coming back to FBI headquarters? And my first concern was the commute. I mean, I would be out of my house for at least another three hours a day. But I, I thought I needed a break from CODIS, and CODIS probably needed a break from me. And so that's my one-man, two-minute voir dire on why I'm standing up here. So I've taken those four different slide decks, and I've linked them together. And I've linked them together based on my experience to share with my, my views and my opinions on, on biometrics. And so this slide's pretty important. It's the standard FBI disclaimer, but it really is the basis of my talk. These are my opinions based on my experience with uh, biometrics within the FBI. So for the last 10 years, I've had optics into the FBI's biometrics operations, research strategy, and partner engagement 
uh, not only with federal, state, and local agencies, but also with international agencies. So well, the first thing I'd like to do is define biometrics. And so I'm doing an awful lot with, with Google, and this is what I came up with. Um, biometrics, the physical human characteristics that can be used to digitally, digitally identify a person, to grant access to systems, devices, and or data. And I think that digital portion is important here. And so as forensic scientists, we do an awful lot of comparisons. Um, could this tire have left this, uh, this uh, impression? Um, did this individual, these this indiv individual's fingerprints? Uh, did this projectile, uh, could it have come from this firearm? And so, but it's the biometrics, those uh, human physical characteristics. Now, I've deliberately left out um, behavioral characteristics. Uh, I won't be talking about that uh, today. And so, um, that's the, the definition. And so, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk uh, about those three disciplines in this order. Um, and I'm going to spend a lot more time on fingerprints than DNA, and a lot more time on DNA than I am on face. But for fingerprints, I consider that the identity verification biometric, the large collections of 10 prints. And so fingerprints, uh, I'm not trying to um, diminish the importance of latent fingerprints, but with 18,000 law enforcement agencies in the United States, the uh, bread and butter um, of our uh, criminal, hist criminal history identification enrollment is those 10 print cards. So it's identity verification. Are you who you say you are? Have you ever been encountered by law enforcement before? So in trying to set up the, uh, the FBI's rapid DNA program, we wanted to know, you know, if all 50 states moved with rapid DNA and arrested DNA testing, what's, what, what's the, the scope of this? And we found out that about 70% of the people that are arrested every year have already been arrested. Uh, and so you have different jurisdictions there, but that national, what, well, that I, nickname I use is Master Criminal File, um, is able to do that for law enforcement when people are arrested in different jurisdictions. And so I consider that the foundational uh, modality of, uh, of biometrics. And then, so there are secondary uses, uh, the latent fingerprint, when you query an, unsolved, uh, an unknown latent against that Master Criminal File. Um, you can get identity discovery. Uh, now, one of the things that I'm doing here is I'm not testifying. These are my opinions, and I'm not worried about, um, I am a little worried about, but I am using identity, identification, and match in a different way than I would in court. Um, so I would like a little bit of upfront forgiveness here. Um, I graduated from high school in 1978, and the week I graduated, Animal House came out. Uh, and so my experience at Penn State for four years, maybe one or two weekends, kind of approached some of the shenanigans in Animal House. But uh, with regard to the forgiveness, um, there's a scene towards the end of the movie where John Belushi um, is trying to rally the troops. One of his fraternity brothers has gotten beaten up by a rival fraternity. Uh, I, was, I was in a fraternity for two years. Uh, and um, they're on double secret probation. And so Belushi's trying to rally the troops here. And he said, did America take it when this happened? Did they lay down a ticket? And they said, did America lay down a ticket when that happened? And finally, and everybody's answering, no, no. And he says, did America lay down and take it when the Germans bombed Pearl Harbor? And everybody yells, no. And they get up and they run out of the room. And there's two guys left, the guy that could beat up and the president. And they look, Germans bombed Pearl Harbor? He goes, uh, he made his point. He carried the room. It's a detail. Let it go. So if you're a fingerprint expert or a facial recognition expert, let it go. Uh, uh, it's probably the way you wouldn't say it, but um, this is, a, a, this is a, a keynote. So what I'm going to do here, um, so identity discovery, DNA. Um, our national DNA database, the CODIS program, exists for one purpose, and that is when you have an unsolved um, uh, DNA profile, um, a forensic unknown, you query that database for identity discovery. 
you can get a name of an individual who uh, may have been involved in that, in that crime scene. And then for face, really is an individualization or identity um, uh, modality at this time, but it's an emerging modality. It's an investigative lead. So I'm going to start off by going through and talk about uh, DHL, DHS and the Office of Biometrics and Identity Management. And the director of that, David Boyd, um, provided these slides. You can see they provided them a little over a week ago. And it's facilitating biometric identity services. So this is identity management on a large scale uh, with over 200 million identities um, for DHS. And so DHS in the upper left, the value of biometrics to DHS is to positively, positively confirm the claimed identity of a traveler, uh, a worker, an applicant, or a detainee. It's also to alert DHS and other law enforcement uh, that the if the individual has derogatory information associated with their biometric. And then also to inform if an individual previously claimed a different persona. And so down at the bottom there, um, OBAM's job is to match, um, store, share, and analyze. I don't know that I would have used match, I would have probably said query. Uh, because uh, with biometrics, the authorities with which you collect a sample often influence what you can query it against, how you can store it, and how you can share it. And so the biometric really isn't, or the modality isn't the issue, but there are significant privacy concerns with storing, sharing, and querying uh, biometrics. And so um, what what um, OBAM is able to do, that office, is um, to provide multimodal automatic, automated biometric identification services. The largest one is the manual fingerprint examiner verification. When a 10 print uh, come in, um, they have staff that can look at those um, if there's any uh, issues with, uh, with the automation being uh, sufficient for that. So lights out doesn't quite work all the time. And they, then they coordinate with the data owners on who can see and share uh, that information. If you look down the lower right, um, within IDENT, there are over 265 million identities. The vast majorities are, are non-US citizens who wanted to travel to the United States. So that we're starting to begin the, the biometrics at the border. And so this is DHS's, um, on the right-hand side there, the 3 o'clock position. Above and below that are the components of DHS. And then you have the State Department at 12 o'clock, the U.S. representatives to, in foreign countries. And then at the bottom, we have uh, specific countries, the Canada and Mexico, the English-speaking uh, countries. Uh, and then you have um, the Department of Justice, so the NGI, the FBI, there in the 11 o'clock position, and DOD uh, in the 8 o'clock position. So this is how DHS works with the Department of Justice and, and DOD um, to secure our borders and to try and prevent people that should not be entering the U.S. Uh, from entering the U.S. So we start there with the red. We have individuals arrested um, domestically, and the FBI houses that. We'll talk about that, that file uh, in a few minutes. And then we have a limited number of biometrics on individuals arrested internationally, but then we cascade those latent fingerprints against um, those, those holdings. And then um, DHS, many of the, their records are from visa applicants, people who want to come to the United States, tourists, students. Um, they're going to come. They're going to help our economy. We want to make that a smooth uh, transition, but we also want to be able to, to protect America. And so there's immigration and border management and benefits go on, but again, it is cascading the latent fingerprints from DOD and DOJ, FBI, against those, uh, those holdings. And then DOD is operating outside of the United States, but also force protection within the United States um, collects biometrics. And so we have the biometric enabled watch list, uh, known and suspected terrorists, but we also have latent fingerprints off IEDs collected outside the United States. And the FBI participates in that with the Terrorist Explosive Device Analytical Center. The FBI laboratory has a facility down at Redstone Arsenal in Huntsville, Alabama. So that's 
um, how biometrics is protecting the United States by collecting fingerprints or receiving fingerprints from outside the U.S. and also from criminals within the U.S. Uh, and then there's sharing um, and how, so you have the, the agency or the entity, the component who owns the record then can determine in um, OBAM's um, software who's going to be able to query um, and if that re is going to be a query retain or it's going to be just a query no retain. And then they can sign different priorities. With 265 million uh, sets of records, um, there's an awful lot of traffic and who gets to see what and how fast, who goes first. And so if you're going to have all that personally identifiable information, you have to secure it. And so there are regulations and laws uh, and fair information practices and principles, but you also have to make sure that it's secure from hackers, and so it has to be, be hardened. And so you comply with privacy, uh, but you also have to make sure that you uh, can uh, withstand cyber attacks. That's a pretty big uh, target. So I really like this slide, it gives you an idea. Um, um, so OBAM in the last hour. So in the last hour, there have been over 25,000 biometric transactions, give you a, an idea of the size, um, or biographic transaction, over 12,000 biometric transactions, almost 1,800 new identities have been loaded in. Um, and if we look down at, the, at ports of entries, over 5,000 uh, customs and border protection entries, and for law enforcement, almost 200,000 want and warrant notifications were received. So there's an awful lot with regard to biometrics uh, trying to protect or, or secure our borders. So now, what I've tried to do here is, with regard to fingerprints and DNA, uh, I've been involved with those for, for quite a while, so I'm using a standard FBI laboratory background, but for our CGIS division and for facial recognition, I'm, I'm going with, uh, with, with their background. So. Uh, you know what I have expertise in and, and, and what I don't. So um, the FBI um, has a science and technology branch uh, that covers more than 5,000 people. It's our facility in Clarksburg, West Virginia with about 3,000 people. There's about eight or 900 at the FBI lab at Quantico. And our operational technology division, OTD, which is digital forensics, um, computer forensics. And that's where um, an awful lot of uh, digital analysis is done. So those three divisions make up the science and technology branch. So if we're talking about the master criminal file or the fingerprints from arrestees in the United States, there's over 77 million of those. Uh, and we have all know about that. That's booking stations. But I don't think we realize the size or the importance of the civil file. Most of the people in here are law enforcement or positions of trust you're probably in that civil file if you had a background check. Um, and so um, do you qualify or do you have something in your history that would disqualify you from a position of trust? So let's talk about that. Um, how does, how does that, um, that file protect us? Well, it actually protects us and our families. It starts if um, you have you know, <clears throat> two people and you have children. Uh, when you put your children in daycare, a licensed daycare uh, background checks as those children grow up and all of the people that work in schools, from the crossing guard to the people in the cafeteria, the, research, the uh, people out on the playground, um, they've all had background checks. When you get older or your family's in the hospital, all of the nurses, the people that push you around in the wheelchair or the gurneys um, out of the operating room, they've all had background checks. Um, and then as you uh, get older, my parents uh, moved into an assisted living facility, an independent living facility, um, and everybody in that facility. So on a daily basis, uh, an awful lot of Americans are protected by that civil file to see if you have uh, um, a disqualifier for the position that you have. People that uh, drive <clears throat> toxic or hazardous materials on the highways, um, they also have to go through this, through this type of background. So there's about um, almost 150 million 10 print cards out at Sieges, and we cascade, law enforcement cascades, the unsolved latent fingerprints against those on a routine basis, which means if you're going to go try and be a crossing guard 
or a bus driver, you, know, you could be linked to an unsolved crime. And that happened with the development of NGI, and it started in 20, 2014. So arrests are made every day because of that. So then let's look at response times. Uh, there was a priority that we saw there. So in the civil response times, it takes about 14 minutes, but for uh, a, a car, a criminal uh, activity uh, response, it's about four minutes in a booking station. And you can see the totals there on a daily basis and then the cumulative totals. But when things, uh, there are certain places that need to be in the express lane, um, and that is a 10 print rap sheet, TPRS. So it's identity check for previous encounters with law enforcement. This is basically DHS, Customs and Border Protection. Test le takes less than eight seconds once those fingerprints are um, at, at a port of entry for the FBI to respond to say, has that person been involved with a, uh, an encounter with law enforcement before? So, I want to talk now about NamUs. NamUs is an NIJ-funded project, um, and it's for, uh, it, part of the NamUs program is uh, a website. And there's two parts to that website. There's the law enforcement web part, and then there's the, um, the public-facing part, where people who have missing um, relatives can go and put up pictures. It's kind of like, um, uh, the, the photos used to be on cartons, milk cartons. Now you can put those photos on the internet. Um, and so this is also accessible by coroners and pathologists, but not our coroners or law enforcement. And they don't have the, the direct query access for unidentified human remains um, that are found in their jurisdiction. And so they can submit those fingerprints um, to the CGIS division that does that query on their behalf. And what we found was there was a gap, because if there was no identification made that way, the fingerprint, there was a response, the transaction went back. Um, but those agencies didn't know that they could then send that, those fingerprints, to the FBI laboratory. And we would take each of those fingers and query it as a, a latent print. So the NGI 10 print algorithm is really based on the fact that you have 10 fingers. And so the chances of missing on all 10 fingers um, is pretty low with that algorithm. And so you can, for the DNA people, that's like having 20 loci um, with CODIS. Um, you have maybe eight to 12 alleles at a loci, but there's a lot more information in the fingerprint than there is in one genetic location. And so knowing that we had these fingerprint cards that were available, um, the FBI started uh, a program where if CGIS, the 10 print people, uh, didn't make an ident, they would automatically send those to the lab. And so this program began on March 1st, 2017, and the first day we got our first hit. And we've had over 265 associations since then, and on a weekly basis, CGIS sends us new, new prints. But in Pima County, Arizona, a border county, we've made 80 identifications. Um, so with people who have crossed the border. Now, they may have come con in contact with law enforcement or they may have um, uh, applied for a visa and had their 10 prints. Uh, so DHS's database has helped identify. So the FBI came up with a new policy. Somebody submits a 10 print card from an identified remain to West Virginia, the FBI lab is automatically going to get that and, and process that. So. Um, very quickly, we'll wrap up fingerprints here. About a year ago, Ethi uh, Ethiopian Fly Air Flight 302 crashed, um, and that crash resulted in highly fragmented um, airplane and highly fragmented um, bodies. And so, Brian Johnson's the guy in, in blue. He's the one that provided me with these slides. He heads the FBI's disaster squad. Um, and so, the FBI disaster squad has been around for like 70 or 80 years, started out with some of the mine collapses and mine fires, coal mines, uh, and they travel the world uh, to provide assistance um, for DVI um, identifications. And so there were 70 fragmented remains who uh, were able to identify through fingerprints. Those are 42 individuals, five of whom were Americans, and there were 16 countries that were represented. Uh, now there were two ways to go about this. You have a manifest, and you can go to those countries and say, do you have fingerprints on those people? And so those were results of 26 IDs that way. 
but 16 IDs came from the FBI or DHS where people had come into the U.S. and encountered law enforcement or had applied for visas and so. Um, and then you can get kind of a cascading effect here. So somebody on that airplane who had applied for a visa, um, the DHS has their fingerprints, they make that identification, they're traveling with their family, and then DNA allows for the kinship analysis to identify that family because that person had visited the U.S. And then, um, so there's an ANSI NIST um, best practices, and now there's an, uh, an ISO standard for post-mortem impression uh, submission and strategy. Uh, and we can provide that link for you. So let's talk now, move on to DNA and CODIS. So we've talked about some of the secondary uses of fingerprints. There is no secondary use um, for, for DNA uh, as far as our national database. So CODIS is the software, NDIS is the database. We've got 158 labs that the FBI provides the router and the encryption device. Um, and they were crime scenes uh, exclusively. And then we have the state labs, the state DNA index system uh, is fed by the local DNA index system. And they house not only crime scenes, but also convicted offenders and arrestees in those states. So we'll move pretty quick here. This is a snapshot of CODIS and our national database for uh, the last uh, 20 years. And you can see we've got um, about 17 million, uh, almost 18 million um, offenders, those are uh, arrestees and convicted offenders, almost a million crime scenes. So the ratio there is 18 or so to, to one. That's not good. We have a problem in this country. We don't have enough capacity for DNA crime scene analysis. Uh, but you can see we've had almost 500,000 investigations aided. And last year, it was almost 50,000. It means our national database provides leads, over 125 leads a day. Um, and what's different about the DNA database is we do latent DNA to latent DNA searches. So we search the national database every day. All unsolved cases are, solved, are searched against um, the uh, offenders. Uh, but we also serve, search those unsolved cases against other unsolved cases. And then those agencies uh, can provide uh, information to each other. Um, and that software has been distributed. 58 foreign countries have national database laws, use code as software. So we don't have the encryption issues with uh, DNA that we've had uh, with, with fingerprints. And so one interesting stat that Europe has uh, really looked at and focused on is if you look at those offender hits, those 360,000, that's where a name was provided to an unsolved crime in the state where the crime was committed. And then 55,000 are hits with an offender in one state and the crime in another. So it shows crime is localized um, and that um, by sharing the information, we have about a 15% um, jump or efficiency in a, a, the database. And so 17,000 latent DNA to latent, or 70, 77,000 latent DNA to latent DNA hits. So there's a lot more regulation with DNA. Fingerprints and faces aren't going to tell you who your parents are, who your parents aren't. And so we had a national law, the DNA Act. And so I came up with this slide about 10 years ago when I was going to Australia, uh, and they were trying to get their national database set up. So the foundation here is federal law requiring quality assurance. DNA must be developed in an accredited laboratory. And then the columns there for holding up the, the roof of the Supreme Court really are activities by people and organizations uh, to ensure quality and integrity uh, and, and for the national database. And then the roof is the CODIS unit that not only manages daily operations, but improves the, the software algorithms and the audit trails. And then there is a person who's ultimately responsible. The director of the FBI is ultimately responsible, but that responsibility uh, lies with the endis custodian. That's currently Lisa Grossweiler and Doug Hares had that position for about 14 years. So they're the gatekeeper of the national database and ultimately they say yes or no on um, audit reports and also on the, uh, the availability, the access uh, to the database. And so as we're moving forward, we now have rapid DNA machines putting a, uh, a, uh, a uh, booking station. Um, NIST in uh, 2008, uh, Pete Ballone, John Butler, um, 
that published, uh, Valone published uh, an article that took the three-hour PCR process, polymerase chain reaction to amplify DNA, and reduced it to less than 30 minutes. And that really, um, the FBI and the Department of Defense took notice of that. And so um, we were hoping that rapid DNA would come along more rapidly than it has. It's taken more than a decade. Um, but in 48 states, the Army and the FBI, Puerto Rico and DC, we still collect ink fingerprints when we collect a DNA sample. So you can't get in the national database with DNA unless you have an inked fingerprint. So we have stone and chisel um, fingerprint technology uh, driving uh, the, the cutting edge uh, DNA technology. What we'd like to do with fingerprint with is uh, take the model of live scan that fingerprints have, has had and, and move forward. Um, and so um, what we want to do is electronically um, transmit a DNA profile within the booking station in under two hours, enroll it in the national database, and then search a segment of the national database. And that's the DNA index's special concern. So these are unsolved homicide, rape, terrorist, and kidnapping cases where you have a complete CODIS profile. And so you're going to have a complete CODIS profile from the arrestee queried against that. So this is lights out DNA, lights out enrollment, lights out searching and matching, and lights out notification. And so the CGIS division has come up with a match manager which converts a rapid DNA or a DNA, a CODIS candidate match message, and it sends that information out to the investigating agency, the booking agency, um, and the arresting agency if they're not the same. And so you can have law enforcement where the individual is being held talk to uh, the agency who's investigating an unsolved crime without the CODIS lab involvement. And then there's a, an insurance message that's sent to the laboratory that developed the DNA profile. But the big advantage uh, of this um, is that every arrestee in the United States that would be processed by a rapid DNA to booking station will be searched against every unsolved case in the United States within 24 hours. So we'll take the weeks and months of snail mail with a DNA swab to then be accessioned and processed. And so um, we get an unsolicited DNA notification. This is modeled after a want or warrant notification. This is also what comes out when you query a latent print against that master criminal file or the civil file. Uh, you get an unsolicited latent notification. Information in blue is about the individual, the arrest event, and the individual information at the bottom has to do with the, the crime that was committed and the contact information for those law enforcements. So um, last September, um, we are able to take this beyond a proof of concept, and so this is the booking station last September at the Washington Field Office of the FBI. Um, seven individuals were arrested early in the morning, um, and six of the seven uh, there was a perfect analysis with a rapid DNA machine, and then they were loaded into the national database. We had no hits, but they were loaded that night uh, and searched into the, um, against all of the unsolved DNA cases in the U.S. So there's two manufacturers. Thermo Fisher um, uh, has the information on uh, the instrument, the Rapid Hit 200, and the Rapid ID, uh, the small instrument on the far right. Um, that has a, does one sample at a time. The other one does uh, four or five samples at a time. And then the Andy 6C uh, is the instrument in black. Uh, and so Calif um, Florida um, and Texas uh, and Louisiana all have pilots underway that will end um, at the end of February. And so based on the FBI uh, and those states, Arizona is also uh, in the pilot phase. Um, We'll come up with national standards and procedures for booking stations to try and, and, and follow the, the, the uh, latent finger or the uh, 10 print live scan instruments in the booking station. So what we're trying to do is go from 50 portals into the national database uh, to hundreds if not thousands. So the thing about DNA, um, there are privacy issues, what's, what's legal, what's constitutional, what's being done. Uh, what actually is reality. So here are the 30 states and the FBI and DOD that uh, have legislative authority to collect DNA uh, at arrest. And in 2013, the Supreme Court said that taking DNA from an individual arrested for a serious crime is 
unconstitutional. So um, that's the law, but the reality is those 17 states in green, DOD, the FBI, and Puerto Rico, they can collect at arrest, and each of those um, states determines what's to be collected. Um, and they can immediately analyze it, so they could go forward with rapid DNA. Those states in yellow, they can collect, but they can't analyze until there's an indictment or some kind of probable cause. And 20 states don't collect. So although we're authorized, um, it's constitutional to do it, two-thirds of the United States does not collect DNA and be able to analyze it at arrest. Unlike fingerprints and mugshots, uh, when the Supreme Court said that taking DNA at arrest is a um, administrative procedure, just like uh, a mugshot or a fingerprint. So uh, you can look at your state and you can see where it is. And the other thing that comes up with uh, DNA is expungements. Um, and so the states on the, the left, um, the burden's on the individual. If they're found innocent or if there's no prosecution, then they, there's a process for them to go through to get their DNA out of their state and therefore the national database. On the right, it's up to the state to, to, to monitor that. So if you want any more information about um, our national database, or rapid DNA, you can just Google um, rapid DNA or CODIS at FBI or send an email to rapidDNA at FBI.gov. So we'll end here with um, next generation identification and facial recognition. So uh, facial recognition is, I view it, similar to our master criminal file. And so these are individuals who were arrested and their mug shots were then taken and submitted to the end. FBI through NGI. And so what's important here is there are no state DMV photos in the interstate photo uh, services. So states, some states have, or states have two different types of photograph uh, repositories or galleys. They have um, the mug shots and they have um, DMV or driver's license photos. So we're talking about arrest photos here. And so um, the FBI's um, next generation identification, I look, is uh, similar to OBAM's management system. And so you have um, scar places for scars, marks, and tattoos, iris, uh, retina. So, um, so it's available to law enforcement. So uh, this is like getting the software and the, the database at the same time. Um, there are best practices. Um, you have to follow um, the FISWIG. Um, uh, training um, for access to this. And then so an important point here, again, in order to submit um, and have your photos, you have to have 10 prints. So it has to be an, an arrest event where uh, 10 prints are electronically captured. Um, and so you, there are 42 million mugshots, um, and uh, that represents about 19 million individuals. And so the, there's an awful lot of um, concern or um, privacy issues around facial recognition. So I'm going to briefly describe um, what facial services are within the FBI out at uh, West Virginia for an FBI investigation or for an FBI joint investigation. So this is initiated by an FBI agent who has a good photograph. You want to get uh, a gallery back and you can get up to um, 50 um, uh, returns in that galley. And so that galley of 50 um, or, uh, uh, candidates comes back and a trained individual will look at them and based on their training go yes, no, yes, no, yes, 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 no, 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 go through those 50. And there's another individual independently looking at that same group of pictures doing the same thing. And if you get to three yeses before you get to two noes, then that's an investigative lead. So there's independent reviews. And so um, that galley of 50 generally results in no investigative lead. But when it does result in an investigative lead, it's a single investigative lead. And there have been three independent reviews that have gone through that. So don't have a lot of time here, but so what I've tried to do is start off with at the border, uh, protecting the U.S., uh, and try to make a, an argument here that 
Um, fingerprints, uh, they're in blue there. The identity verification, the foundational biometrics. You don't get DNA or face into a national databases in the U.S. without those 10 prints. And the challenges for biometrics, that digital querying and exchange and sharing, come along with the authorities for which the samples were collected. Can they be searched? Can they be retained? Can they be shared? They expunged. And the secondary uses. I've talked about the secondary uses of DDI um, uh, within the United States and, and um, also um, with international. And then DNA, but DNA can also do a kinship um, that the other modalities can't do. So what I've done here is, is shared my views or my opinions. Um, and as forensic scientists, we really do an awful lot of comparisons. But it's when you go and query against large databases that I think that term biometric um, or biometric databases come in. So most crimes in America are committed by Americans, and the victims of those crimes are Americans. And biometrics protects Americans from Americans and protects America. And I believe that fingerprints are the cornerstone of that. So fingerprints to me are the, <clears throat> the common currency that allows biometrics to be searched and shared across modalities. And so I'd like to thank the, uh, the Academy for the opportunity to speak here today, and thank you for your attention.